Okay. So as I said last, but absolutely not least, uh, we conclude appropriately, or near conclude, because those who can stay will have a conclusion to the conclusion. Um, the closing panel is called appropriately Kaplan and the Future of the Reconstructionist Movement. Uh, it features a really nice um, cross-section of enormously talented rabbis, two senior in the field, not senior people, but senior in experience. One youthfully middle-aged, <laughs> early middle-aged, and one almost brand new, at least from my, <laughs> from my vantage point. And the three, <laughs> that was meant as a compliment, the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> and uh, uh, three of the four, seri in all seriousness, have an amazing, uh, I, I think I'm right, have an amazing combination of a lot of synagogue experience and a lot of experience at the same time outside of the walls of synagogues, which gives for a particular interesting perspective. And it's, again, entirely fitting that uh, our chair, Rabbi Rachel Gardner, as you learned yesterday, if you didn't already know, is indeed the Jewish chaplain of Georgetown University. So, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Dan and Eric, for uh, inviting us to be a part of this day. And um, it's my pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues here and virtually here. As I think Jessica wrote in saying that, you know, if we're look forward looking, she's, this is forward looking in form, right? As form as well as content, we are, we are in the future. Um, so I, I, we, I, of course, am excited by the charge uh, to consider Kaplan in the future of the Reconstructionist Movement of Judaism America and even in the world more generally. Not that I'm biased or anything, but for me as a practitioner of Reconstructionist Judaism, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what it's all about. How does Kaplan's work play out in real life? So as Dan mentioned, when we were putting together this panel, we wanted um, rabbis working in, in a range of fields, congregations, campus, chaplaincy, social justice, education, and each of the rabbis you will hear from uh, in moments uh, themselves have uh, worked in various contexts. So we have two rabbis who founded Reconstructionist congregations, um, one who's served at the college. I served at a Re Reconstructionist congregation for many years before I came here, uh, and I'm on the board of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association. We have um, Jessica, who is uh, a campus rabbi as well, and all of the rabbis here are very strong voices in the movement. There are also some rabbis out there. Um, uh, rabbis, rabbi Louis Enron, who's a chaplain, and there, I'm sure there are other folks that I'm missing, but we will be happy to hear you chime in um, throughout our time. So let me just tell you a little bit. In fact, I, I think I'll let you uh, look at the bios of our panelists in the interest of time but I'll tell you what we asked them to address. We asked the, our panelists three questions. First, in what ways does Kaplan most significantly inform your rabbinate? Okay, another way to think of that is, where do you find Kaplan's ideas most alive in your work on the ground every day? It's the first question, and they'll answer them in any order that, that you feel comfortable answering them. The second is, which of Kaplan's ideas have not proven significant? or alive in your rabbinate, and uh, whose time may indeed have come and gone if it ever actually arrived in the first place. <laughs> and then lastly, which unfulfilled elements of Kaplan's agenda for the reconstruction of Jewish civilization do you think we should be focusing on and would contribute most meaningfully to the future of, reconstruction, of the Reconstructionist movement and Judaism more generally? So with that, I... Uh, turn to my esteemed colleague and friend, Rabbi Dr. Jeffrey Schein. Thank you, and hello everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor. When I was asked to join the panel and reflect on being a Reconstructionist rabbi and my relationship to Kaplan, somehow I was reminded of about 10 years ago when our oldest, my wife Deborah is here, our oldest son Ben was about to be married and he called me up and he said, Abba, 
I, for our wedding, I want to give you the opportunity to be my Abba and not a rabbi. And I got very flustered, and I told him, Ben, whatever you want, I just want you to have the kind of wedding you want. But, but I can't separate who I am from being a rabbi. And by extension, I can't separate in any way being a Jew from being a Reconstructionist Jew from being a Reconstructionist Kaplanian Jew. They are all really woven together. So what I would like to do is to respond to the questions Rachel thoughtfully put before us. And I'm going to start with those moments in my work, and I'll particularly focus on the 20 years where I was the education director for the uh, for FIRCH and JRF, for the National Reconstructionist Movement, where I thought I was properly channeling Kaplan. I was aligned with his sources, and I think living out a Kaplanian dream. So I'm going to start with one around study and, and Jewish study. I'm going to point right back here to what looks to me like Eitz Chaim, the tree of life, symbol of the Jewish civilization um, program here, and share with you that between 1998 and 2002, was very involved in developing an adult learning program for the Reconstructionist movement called Eitz Chaim We. And the We was really quite intentional. We accepted Barry Holtz's lovely formulation and back to the sources that you want Jews to be part of the conversation, but we were radically Kaplanian, I believe, in saying that everyone should be part of that conversation. And so what Eitz Chaim We was, was a program across the country focused on Chamesh Megillot, sort of orphan pieces of Tanakh to begin with, where there would be adult study and commentary generated. We tried to match up congregations. so They would be sharing commentary. It turned out to be a wonderful piece of adult learning, but we didn't generate the kind of buzz around textual dialogue responding to Jews across all of North America and the Reconstructionist movement, in part because the technological platforms couldn't sustain it. But what we were after, which I think is uh, wonderfully Kaplanian, is the, um, the sense of a Jewish text, a text and then a Jewish text being a glue for an entire community. And Robert Scholes, a literary scholar, wrote in 1985 in the book, The Power of Textuality. What we have here is an endless web of growth and change and interaction, learning and forgetting, dialogue and dialectic. Our task as teachers is to introduce students to this web to make it real and visible to them insofar as we can, and to encourage them to cast their own strands of thought and text into this network so that they will feel its power and understand both how to use it and how to protect itself from its abuses. For several years, Rabbi Shai Gluskin, who had followed me as the education director of the Reconstructionist Movement, engaged in Torah Quest, where this process was physicalized, where as people generated commentary around a piece of Torah, literally they created a web that reflected the interaction of those things. And um, last year I completed um, a, a, a wonderful year and a half as the um, director of a project known as the Transformative Text Project, which links seven Reconstructionist congregations to the rabbinical college, trying to see if we could build a full year of learning for all ages across the um, Reconstructionist movement or for these seven experimental partners that we had. So that felt really deeply Reconstructionist to me. I want to go back now in time and share with you an emperor has no clothes moment for Jewish education. My work has been largely in Jewish education. Throughout the late 1970s, flowing into the 80s and 90s, building into a kind of crescendo, there was this amazing discovery that the emperor had no clothes. For decades, people had been asking, how can we educate Jewish children? And it became clear that far from being our partners, that the parents who were there had exhausted their cultural capital. They had not enough Jewish memories in their repository of memories, not enough skill in their skills to support the work we needed to do 
but being always the Kaplanian optimist, I and many other people said, well, we just have to change our notion of who the client of Jewish education is. We're working with the family, not with the individual student. Hence, a re really amazing spate of creative programs, some of which continue today, and a heady sense for those people who are shaping this new field of family education of, boy, this is the var chadash. This is really a chidush. This is a new thing in Jewish education. And I thought so too, until in the course of teaching my students at Siegel College a course on four visions of Jewish education, I paid careful attention, was forced to pay careful attention to these words from Kaplan's chapter on Jewish education. The field of the Jewish teacher's activity and influence must be enlarged, or there will soon be no Jewish teachers. If a Jewish teacher education is to prove worth its worth in this country, the scope of the Jewish teacher must be enlarged to include the home and the child he teaches. In fact, most of the influence he wishes to exert on the family, he must learn to exert through the medium of the parent. The teacher should be the one to establish the point of contact between the moral and religious generalizations and the specific situations and occasions in which they should be bedded, embedded. He should serve as the pastor to the family of the children who, whom he has to inculcate the patterns of Jewish education. One more Kaplanian debt that I want to acknowledge, and you can help me with this. This is really a paradox. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you agree with this side of the paradox. It's really important to have good Jewish schools. Please raise your hand if you believe that's the case. Okay? As good as Jewish schools can be, we can't confuse that with a total Jewish education. Raise your hand if you believe that to be the case. So. We are in the fertile ground, then, of this important paragraph from the same chapter on education and Judaism as a civilization. It is necessary to change radically the very notion of what it is to constitute the educative process through which the objectives of an effective and attractive type of Jewish education will be attained. If Jews rely solely upon the school to achieve these aims, they are bound to fail. In the process of education, as in other phases of social and spiritual activity, Jews cannot permit themselves the luxuries of having practice lag behind theory. In all modern theories of education, is reiterated again and again that we respond much more readily to activities than to ideas. The mind is normally motor active rather than contemplative. Another truth which is continually emphasized, education is not a process distinct from life in general, nor is it to be confined to the four walls of the school. So my work in education for four decades or so has been very informed by this paradox. And on the one hand, I, like Kaplan in the same chapter, I have extraordinary empathy and feel a need to respond to that teacher who is trying to teach about God and feels trapped by the text that he's teaching. Can't teach about God because God is presented in the narrative in a different way than a spiritual discussion about God would allow. So Kaplan has a strategy of differentiating, which I've tried to build on in several essays, of differentiating so that the story becomes what acculturates you into the story of the Jewish people. You can swallow that whole, and the discussions of God become important dialogues about the role of God as the anchor of your Jewish values and the source of your spirituality. I want to offer an example that has some local color that sort of bridges those two worlds. At Adat Shalom in Bethesda in the early 90s, Adat Shalom was part of a national covenant project that I had the great pleasure and honor of heading up, where we had 10 congregations working together around family and intergenerational learning, and each took on one of the values of spiritual peoplehood. I'll say a word more about that phrase in just a moment but took on one of the values and developed programs. The value of the Dat Shalom was chuchmah, so they concentrated their energies around programs in body chuchmah. One of those was called chaverim betelephone. 
and it embraces and, uh, and links the formal affirmation of the importance of school learning, getting good at Hebrew, if only at the level of decoding, and the broader purposes of Jewish life. Here's the way it worked. People in the congregation, largely older, not exclusively, who had some Hebrew skill and were willing to give 20 minutes a week to kids were linked up as partners. They became chaverim. And they spent those 20 minutes directed by some guidance from the education director to help that student come into class better prepared, more practice with the prayers, and to do better with Hebrew. But the real keter, the real crown of that process, was not the increase in Hebrew, though we cared a great deal about that, but the relationships that formed. And um, we, we saw Shabbat dinners begin to happen. We saw relationships. And it's been my pleasure these last three years to see in my congregation, Kohalev in Cleveland, a rebirth of Haverim Betelephone, now as Haverim Betelephone or Skype or at your local Mitchell's ice cream place. And it has the same depth of building community. This notion of, okay, this notion of um, building out of um, these blocks of, of relationships is reminiscent of a wonderful um, philosopher, theorist of education, Ivan Illich, who in the early 70s wrote about de-schooling society in favor of, he didn't call them chavrutas, but learning packages that could be created. The reform movement and their B'nai Mitzvah revolution is going to be uh, trying to address the case of Sarah in a very systemic way. Sarah is, has had a fairly good bar mitzvah, but her real passion for in life is violin. She's very clear that she won't stay in the religious school beyond B'nai Mitzvah, but we're finding a match for Sarah. We're finding a Jewish violinist who can mentor her and keep her deeply involved in Jewish life. I'm just going to say a very quick word about where the Kaplanian um, proposition breaks down for me. Uh, it doesn't break down. I want to differentiate between where it's extended via the question that was asked earlier. I've been here for all four days, so I see the continuity of these questions. Someone asked, what does the new neuroscience say about Kaplan the way we do Jewish education? Well, Kaplan knew not that neuroscience. I don't know it deeply, but I know it well enough to have taught courses on the amazing brain and Jewish education. And I know that, um, that what we're learning about the brain and its work, and the best book to turn to this, read Ari Brofman's Chaos Theory. Ari Brofman's the one who worked with General Dempsey to create psych circles of open dialogue in the army. Can you think of a more hierarchical organization? And he did it successfully. He talks about white spaces, and you give the brain enough time, it will organize itself and turn chaos into some amazing order. And finally, I'll skip other things, but I want to say that um, I think that in the work I've done on spiritual peoplehood, if you're at Camp JRF, you would say ooh-ah, because those are the values that uh, enter it, and that was a critique of Kaplan's emphasis on peoplehood. But as I've done that, I've also given thought and would offer, in conclusion, something about a, uh, a emendation, a friendly emendation. Manny Goldsmith said on Shabbat, you want to know what Kaplan's about? You can forget everything else I said. Just call it durable happiness. I don't think that captures the ethos of the Reconstructionist rabbis I work with these days. I would change that to deep and durable shleimut. I think that's a better capturing of what we're about than, um, than a utilitarian form of happiness that has its place, but is really part of an old Kaplan agenda. So we, am I on? Yep. Uh, we turn now to my dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Jessica Lott, and she's speaking to us from her home somewhere near uh, Maryland. Uh, you know, she's at, she's, um, I'm sorry, she's at, she is Maryland's, Maryland Hillel's Associate Director for Jewish Life and Learning, and I assume you're somewhere near campus right now. I'm really thrilled to be uh, on this panel and a little 
overwhelmed uh, and humbled to be uh, among these great uh, thinkers and scholars who have known uh, and had Kaplan in their lives for much longer than I. So I'll do my best. Um, and I also want to say that I feel um, sort of assume that part of why Rachel uh, extended the invitation to me is also to sort of bring forth the voices of the students that I work with on campus every day. Um, and when I was thinking about those questions, I was thinking about the ways in which uh, I used that which I learned at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College from Kaplan and his intellectual descendants. Um, well, how do I use that every day and how is it resonating with the students uh, on campus who I encounter? Um, I think that the basic idea, sort of the most basic idea that Judaism is an evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people resonates with me in my work every day. This is language that he gifted to us and it's absolutely a key piece for solving um, a puzzle about Jewish life and Jewish identity that many of my students face. Um, they resonate really deeply with the concept of juggling lots of different identities. Um, perhaps most so while they're in college, in that developmental stage of differentiating as an independent adult. Um, living, especially in these temporary, often experimental kinds of community. Who is my community today? Who is my community this afternoon? Who am I living Judaism with in, my, in this temporary home that I've assembled of my friends, rather than the home that I uh, lived in growing up uh, reflecting the choices of my parents. Um, these students, I would argue, live in way more than two civilizations. And working with them, I'm sort of constantly aware of not only uh, that, that concept, but a few other key Kaplanian concepts. Um, one is the idea of the tradition having a vote and not a veto, that we're in relationship with the past, but not totally beholden to it. Um, this idea that it's actually our job to be charting a course for the future, um, especially in a university setting, the whole academic process is about learning the wisdom of those who came before you and making some sort of meaning of it. I think, unfortunately, many college students today are being asked um, not to chart their own course, but to regurgitate the past rather than reconstructing it. Um, but students are definitely in that process of learning and um, what Kaplan would probably call that progressive unlearning of, of what they came with. Um, the trend of sort of questioning the status quo is probably not for new for college students as a developmental stage, but it's new for every individual college student as they face it. And it's new for each generation of students. I find uh, that reconstructionist thought provides me with a language and a framework with which I can talk about these bigger questions of their lives um, and with, with Jewish language. Um, sort of on a related note, I think this idea that, that Kaplan brought that science doesn't have to destroy belief in the miracle um, is absolutely at play for the students that I work with across the religious spectrum. And I'll talk a little bit more about that religious spectrum uh, in a minute. Um, the other piece that I would say is what I, I don't know that uh, Kaplan ever called it this, but this a concept of sort of self reinvention. Um, part of what he said was the only way to change the world is to change yourself into what you want others to be. So this is being negotiated in real time in my work uh, every day. This question surfaces when students are faced with new ideas and new concepts, um, and they're faced with difference in a much deeper way than they have before in their lives. And what I find is that my work as a Jewish educator and our work as a Jewish institution, that is Hillel, is to step up to that obligation that we have to bring Judaism and Jewish expression into that conversation that students are having about the other parts of their lives. Um, the other key concept that I find surfacing is, um, is pluralism. Um, also, not necessarily that he would have called it that, but that's how I grouped it. <laughs> um, there is sort of a, a what I call a battle to define what is authentic Jewish expression that's being waged on campuses every day. 
And campuses are just a microcosm of a battle that's happening on the world Jewish stage. Um, and even the Orthodox students that I work with are grappling with where are the boundaries, what habits and values are most meaningful. Um, and uh, one of Kaplan, sort of a Kaplan quote that I, that I bring often uh, to my work to remind me why I care about pluralism anyway, um, is that he said reconstructionism seeks to put gates through fences that divide Jews into separate groups. Offering keys to those gates is extraordinarily exciting, extremely difficult, uh, and absolutely essential. Um, I would also say that um, the other piece that really um, resonates is that it is this idea that it's on us to build what our community is going to look like and to go through a process of articulating our values. Um, I'll touch for a moment on um, the future. <laughs> um, and uh, part of what I'll say is one thing that I think might be uh, still unfulfilled, but that's getting closer and closer toward fulfillment um, is with regard to uh, what Kaplan had to say about Israel. And I, I think about it, especially today, many of my colleagues are and students are gathering at the APAC policy conference and Birthright and Open Hillel and Women of the Wall and all of these things are part of the talk of the day. And I'm absolutely reminded of how Kaplan wrote and spoke about Israel. Uh, I, I had a conversation just a few weeks ago with, I have a Jewish agency Israel fellow working with me on campus and she has been with us for two years and is returning to Israel. And one of the things that she said is that just as she's been tasked with being a shlicha, right, a messenger from Israel to our campus, she absolutely feels it's her responsibility to be a shlicha back to Israel and bring with her what she's learned from American Judaism. Kaplan knew that Zionism absolutely couldn't be limited to the state. Um, and his idea of greater Zionism that would help Israel impact the diaspora and the diaspora positively influence Israel is alive and well in what we see, especially with regard to Jewish education and how we live progressive Judaism. Uh, the epicenters of progressive Judaism and Jewish education are in the United States and Israelis are coming to us to learn. Um, and, and that's exciting and an important obligation on our shoulders just really living out that sort of Kaplanian Zionism. Um, one thing that maybe I would say, ah, another thing that in terms of the future is that on campus, we're really, and this uh, connects back with what I was saying about pluralism before, there's interdenominational and non-denominational and all that going on. And having me as a reconstructionist rabbi teaching reform, conservative, orthodox, and just Jewish students is a huge move for reconstructionism as a movement. And I think is hugely important because I'm able to give them regardless of where they come from on the Jewish spectrum, a language and a framework with which to wrestle with their Jewish identities and with shaping the Jewish future. Um, reconstructionist rabbis are overrepresented in Hillel. Uh, and I think that's for good reason because Hillel is also a movement thinking daily about how we navigate Jewish life in community and what the future of Judaism can and should look like. Um, and we absolutely are having an impact there in ways that are super important. Uh, in terms of what's not necessarily working or what's also still getting worked out, uh, I think the thing that comes up for me the most regularly is actually um, Kaplan's theology and God concept, whether that was in my time at RRC just a few years ago um, or leading the Reconstructionist Youth Movement trip to Israel um, in conversation with students on a day-to-day -day basis. It's sort of the one thing that I'm finding people not necessarily um, having traction or using the same vocabulary that Kaplan used to talk about God. And that's whether it's because they're sort of devoutly atheist and don't care about God in their conception of Jewish identity, or whether that's because they really do feel intimately connected to a personal God who is intervening in their daily lives. Um, and those are things that folks who hold all sorts of other connection points with Reconstructionist Judaism and the, and the way the values are lived out, um, and this is, is a connection point that I have found fewer and fewer folks 
who are falling sort of directly uh, in line with him in that regard. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. And uh, finally, I don't really need to get up, but take a little seven minute stretch. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Rabbi Dr. Sid Schwartz, who is c currently at CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. Thank you, Rachel. It's a little disconcerting to be as remote as I am. First of all, although you may see me in front of you, the view I have is at the back of your heads. Uh, so I wish I had some eye contact. Um, and to add insult to injury, uh, my view of the screen where I'm looking uh, is obstructed by a column. Uh, but maybe it's just as well that I don't see myself talking to myself because that would be even more disconcerting. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be part of the conference. I should say that uh, because I don't see the faces in the room, uh, I had the pleasure of being part of the Shabbaton, which was the kickoff for the conference at Adat Shalom, uh, sitting out where I serve as the founding rabbi. And uh, I guess what I wanted to say in the outset, the, the Shabbaton was a fabulous kickoff uh, where many of the speakers from the conference joined us for Shabbat and it was programming throughout the day. Uh, if there's any piece of evidence of the ongoing relevance of Kaplan's thought to American Jewry, uh, I think those who were at Adat Shalom Shabbat morning uh, saw a bit of proof of the pudding. Uh, a packed uh, synagogue on Shabbat morning, and that was only one of three services that were happening that morning. There were two other alternatives uh, with other people going on, other things going on, different kinds of uh, tefillah experiences, uh, and then programming throughout the day with more than 200 people, even after the Oneg. Um, and Adashlam was a community, at this point, one of the largest reconstruction synagogues in the country with a program that would be the envy of uh, synagogues two or three times the size. Uh, and I think that's just one piece of, you know, what Kaplan's thinking has wrought in terms of the reality uh, of, of American Jewish life. Now, I put that out there with a little bit of a paradox that I'm going to head towards, because I think that there's an ongoing tension between Kaplan's resolute commitment for most of his life not to allow Reconstructionism to become a party, uh, a term we would use today would be a denomination. Uh, that was the, the creation of the RRC uh, came after decades of opposition of Kaplan to that exact uh, phenomenon. And I want to talk about the tension between the, the denominational manifestation of Jewish life and the trans-denominational programming that's going on today, uh, and I'll get to that in a few moments. But I'm going to follow the order that Rachel set out. Uh, the first question was, uh, what are the key ideas of Kaplan that have informed my rabbinate and my thinking? Uh, I'm going to play off of Jessica's comments and actually challenge you a little bit, Jessica, on, uh, on the piece of theology, uh, only because for me, what Kaplan did was identify the space between the two polarities that you gave voice to. And that is that, uh, yes, there are people who are comfortable with a personal slash supernatural God. And then there are those who reject that if they're exposed to it, and they think the only alternative to that is some kind of atheist position, uh, whether it's uh, secular Judaism or uh, a secular Zionism of some sort. And Kaplan essentially navigated the space between those two poles. Now, I would agree with you that the language he used to do that doesn't quite resonate today for most people. But for me, to have been exposed in my teen years, uh, to Kaplan's thinking, and, and this story I, I should add as a parenthetical because uh, it hopefully we'll get at least a bit of a chuckle. Uh, I, I was exposed to Kaplan by having a book, uh, Judaism as a Civilization, was snuck to me by my uncle, who was a conservative rabbi. And now most uh, boys of age 16 had their uncle sneak them a copy of Playboy, and they enjoy that. Uh, I instead got snuck a copy of Judaism as a Civilization, uh, but took to it quite well. And in reading that, I found that there was a space between the two poles. Uh, I had already rejected the God that I learned about in the Orthodox yeshiva in which I was raised. Uh, and I probably would have gone quickly to that secular extreme had I not found Kaplan. Now, it's true that since the years I've read Kaplan, I've found many other theological uh, positions more compelling 
uh, than Kaplan's. But I think we owe a big debt of gratitude to Kaplan uh, for identifying this area of what he called religious humanism, um, a uniquely, a uniquely framed combination of humanistic thinking but ha that has a spiritual component. The second key idea uh, for me uh, was the emphasis that Kaplan puts uh, on social justice. Uh, that has been at the core of my rabbinate. Uh, my first position after I left Philadelphia was as the head of the Jewish Community Relations Council uh, here in Washington, D.C. I came down here in 1984, uh, where I had the chance to lead the community on uh, a whole range of public policy issues from uh, Israel to Soviet Jewry, which was the cause that I had spent 25 years involved in, uh, to domestic social justice, environmental issues, uh, and the like. Uh, and that grew clearly out of my uh, study of Kaplan, uh, seeing that if, if Judaism slash if faith uh, does not lead us to a position that allows us to be in the world with a deep commitment uh, to advancing greater peace and justice in the world, then it is for naught. Uh, it is simply a, a kind of a, a self-indulgent uh, preoccupation. Uh, so that was very important. And when I left the JCRC, uh, I established an organization called Panim, which I lived for about 21 years, uh, which explored the nexus between Jewish learning, values, and social responsibility. In the course of those years, uh, we touched the lives of over 20,000 young people. And what I know to be true is that many of those young people came to us at a time when they would have otherwise gone AWOL from Jewish life. Uh, because for the vast majority of young American Jews, uh, religious school education that they get in their synagogues is so uninspiring, is such a turnoff, that within a year or two of their bar bat mitzvah, they essentially have, are saying, I'm out of here, I'm not interested. And so we had a program that essentially captivated the imagination of young Jews to say, if you want to make a difference in your community, in your country, in the world, number one, Judaism has a, uh, a repository of wisdom that is as rich as any repository in the world. And you can use it to navigate the most difficult moral and ethical dilemmas that face our nation and our communities. Use it. And number two, we were able to show that the Jewish community was, in fact, among the most politically active sub-communities that America has ever seen. And they could follow those footsteps not to mimic the policies of the previous generation, but to realize that the generations that came before them had fought to get a seat at the table and that they could take those seats themselves. That was a powerful message, and that too came out of the strong teachings from Kaplan and from Ira Eisenstein about the importance of social justice at the center of Judaism. The third piece of Kaplan that I think is so relevant uh, to, and ongoing to this day is in his talking about Jewish civilization and indicating that religion was but one piece of a larger complex of the phenomenon we call Jewish life or Jewish civilization, Kaplan in some ways uh, predicted or understood what we're now reading in things like the Pew study. And that is that so many American Jews who have a positive identification with the Jewish identity actually aren't that interested in the religious dimension of it. Now, Kaplan may not have been happy with that if he, if he read those stat, th that data today, but he understood that there was a way to be Jewish outside of the realm of religion. And he validated that in a way that no one had done before. Uh, and I think there, there too, it suggests some of Kaplan's prescience. Now, I want to say a word, as I indicated earlier, about this tension between the non-party, non-denominational uh, thinking of Kaplan and the fact that Reconstructionism today has emerged as the fourth denomination in American Jewish life. When I went to RRC in the uh, mid-1970s, uh, there was one of our colleagues, Jeff will know who it is, I won't name him, uh, he had a, a hobby was to look through all the press, wherever the Jewish press mentioned the three movements of American Jewish life, and he'd write a letter to the editor to say, don't forget, we're out there too, the Reconstructionists. Uh, I think we don't have to do that quite as much any longer. We are recognized. Now there are other groups that say, hey, what about us? Don't forget us. Uh, and much good has come out of the fact that the RRC was created, and we have a school that has been able to train uh, several hundred rabbis and uh, a movement that has thriving congregations, uh, not unlike on Dach Shalom. And yet, to be truth, other than my work in establishing a Dach Shalom, 
which I continue to be quite proud of and where I continue to dive in, all of my work has been outside of the denominational realm. And most of the most, most of the most exciting work that's happening in Jewish life today is happening on a transdenominational or post-denominational basis. Uh, I'm right now involved in a program working uh, with uh, young rabbis around the country under the auspices of CLAL. Uh, the program is called the Clergy Leadership Incubator, CLE, uh, from the Hebrew term clay kodesh, meaning clergy. And we're training rabbis to be transformational visionary spiritual leaders with the ability to change the nature of the American synagogue to create the kind of compelling spiritual communities that we so desperately need. Uh, what I know to be true is that in working in these transdenominational settings, there is a power in crossing those boundaries that exceeds anything that any one denomination could do on its own. And I'm not just talking about, I'm not pointing fingers at any movement. No movement on its own can teach and shape Judaism as powerfully as what we can do when we come together. And unfortunately, I mourn the fact that today the jealousies and the turf consciousness of the denominations continues to get in the way of the best kind of thinking and the best kind of programming that really need to lead our community forward. So I think it's just worth thinking about that. So uh, it, let me say uh, the two last things I want to observe. Um, one about an idea of Kaplan's that, whose time has passed. And I want to say this because I want to, uh, it's really one of the themes of, of my new book, Jewish Megatrends. Uh, and then the last thing, an idea that Kaplan had, which has great promise for the future. Kaplan was perhaps the most prominent, but was in a class of thinkers, rabbis, philosophers that articulated the ethos of 20th century Judaism. Uh, I would date it from, from 1880 the beginning of the big emigration of Jews from Eastern Europe to 1980. For those hundred years, the East ethos of American Jewry, uh, of Judaism, American Judaism, that Kaplan so well articulated, was to put out a model of Judaism that would allow Jews to fully enjoy the fruits of America and all that it offered without jettisoning one's Jewish identity. It was, it was kind of an accommodationist, uh, integrationist uh, modality. And Kaplan was joined by people like Horace Kalin, who's the uh, architect of cultural pluralism, uh, or Milton Convitz, who taught at Cornell, who wrote a shelf full of books about how the Bible and Judaism were consistent with each other in terms of ideals. But I want to argue that that ethos is an ethos whose time has passed. Uh, today, American Jews don't need to have lectures or books written, written or movements created to tell them that they belong in America. We've done that quite nicely, thank you. Uh, whether it was because of Kaplan or not, I'm not sure we can attribute it to him. But Reconstructionist philosophy clearly created a framework that allowed that to happen. Today, I think we need to articulate an idea, ideology of Judaism that declares Judaism to be radically countercultural, not in the notion of the 1960s, although if you want to have some drugs and rock and roll, it ain't so bad, uh, but rather in the notion that what America offers us today is not sufficient. It is culturally vacuous. It is spiritually bankrupt. And in that setting, Americans are looking for places of meaning and purpose. Judaism should be, first and foremost, a place where Jews can find that. And that is not to make the case that we are the same as America. It's for us to say that without leaving America, we can offer an alternative to the cultural uh, wasteland that is uh, American cultural life today. Uh, and that is an ethos quite different than Kaplan could have ever anticipated. And I don't blame him for it. I think in that way, Kaplan was a product of his time, even though he was ahead of his time. But I think the tide has turned on that philosophy that Kaplan and people like Kalin and Convitz also articulated. The last thing I'll say is uh, an idea which I think we haven't sufficiently uh, explored of Kaplan's. You know, Kaplan's radical idea about uh, theology and, and his rejection of chosenness is so important. And other people have built on Kaplan's uh, work without attributing it, by the way. Uh, I think notably of Jonathan Sachs's book, The Dignity of Difference, that makes very much the same point that Kaplan was making 75 years before Sachs wrote his book. Uh, not to say his Sachs books is not important, but the importance of the idea, I think, cannot be sufficiently underscored. Uh, and that is that we need to create a world where 
religion, where faith communities are not put at odds with each other because each of us are basing ourselves on a triumphalist vision that our truth is the only truth out there. And what we see is that where religion has become essentially poisonous to society, it's not just in America, but throughout the world, is where that triumphalism that Kaplan rejected is once again ascendant. But even more than that, not, not only is the case that Kaplan has argued that we can love and be passionate about our faith without saying we're the best or we're the only truth out there, but I think the other piece that we haven't even explored sufficiently is to understand, I believe that in 50 years, people will be amazed that we have not thought about our faith in greater concert with other faith communities as well. We are one piece of the wisdom of the world. Uh, now, I will give a lot of credit here to the work that Nancy Fuse Kramer is doing at RRC, uh, doing some amazing work in, in interfaith uh, learning, uh, but we're only scratching the surface of it. I think we understood the implications of Kaplan's teachings. We would understand, and by the way, it's appropriate that this conference is happening at Georgetown, which has a magnificent tradition of, uh, of interfaith work and understanding where each faith uh, is informing the other. And I think this is something that Kaplan is really pointing the finger, uh, is pointing the direction for that we need to explore all the more uh, in the years uh, to come. Thank you. Thank you. David. Thanks for the shout out. Um, so uh, we're going to just take a, a, li a couple minutes of rabbis going back and forth with each other, uh, and then we'll open it up to, to the questions. And I know Rabbi Shine wanted to. Uh... The history of America is my history. I was educated in the public schools of my community. The history of America is my history. But Hebrew is my tongue, too. And Jewish history is my background, also. Lincoln and Jefferson are my heroes, together with Moses, Akiva, and Maimonides. They all get along in my imagination most companionably. At no point am I conscious of strain between the two worlds. I move one, from one to the other with such naturalness that I am scarcely aware of the change in spiritual locale. That's from Milton Steinberg's Partisan Guide to the Jewish Problem. And I both agree and disagree with Sid, mostly agree, that we're well beyond the place where living in two civilizations is a helpful rubric in the sense that what I like to call this easy eclecticism or this integrationist strategy needs something else. Um, I'm working with uh, Eric on trying to appropriate some of the thinking from Michael Rosenack, the Educate the Gaon of Israeli Jewish education, who's much bigger than education because of his appreciation of paradox and creative tensions. And I think that we need a meta understanding of our relationship to the civilization that doesn't cancel it out, but learns how to thrive on the differences. Um, I do think, Sid, my only disagreement is. I think there are wonderful things still about American culture, and I'm not ready to, um, to, um, to consider it a wasteland. Um, I think there are pockets of wasteland in it, and Judaism can help be a corrective or critique, but it's not a wasteland. You know, I, just to, to chime in from the, the millennials kind of generation perspective, I, I, whereas Kaplan was, as Sid, you were pointing out, was talking about how do we as Jews feel ourselves as belonging here, I don't know where to look at you. Mm -hmm. um, I find with students that their question is, do I belong in Judaism? And uh, they're confident in their American identities and skeptical, um, if not uh, either uneasy or uh, you know, uh, not confident in their Jewish identity, all the way to, to skeptical that they, there's anywhere where they, you know, where they belong. So for me, however, I, sometimes I feel that Cap Kaplan, as Jessica mentioned, is a, is a gateway. And I'm wondering if Sid, uh, someone said, I think it was Jeff who said that, uh, or maybe Sid, you said, Kaplan opened up the space for you theologically to then explore things that you explored, maybe, I don't know if you would say past, but other than Kaplan theologically. And um, I find that Kaplan is the, the, en the entrance both into feeling accepted theologically. I don't know if I believe in this kind of God. I don't, you know, where do I fit in? Also in terms of peoplehood and acknowledging 
right, the broader understanding of what, what Judaism um, expects of us, invites of us, validates in us. My question is, do we get stuck there? And how do we move with our, with our students? Um, you know, peoplehood, someone, someone spoke in the last panel about reducing uh, the idolatrous reduction of Judaism to peoplehood. And, um, you know, I, 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 I wonder about that a lot in terms of the way we put some, where we're putting our programming, where we're putting our energy, and I'm sort of wondering what you've found maybe has worked to take us to the next place, and what isn't working to take us to the next place. Is that a question? There's a question. Okay. Right. Um, so let me just say a, thing, a few uh, words to Jeff and, and Rachel for that observation. Uh, you know, you, I describe in, uh, in my analysis of Jewish megatrends, I talk about the fact that next-gen Jews, specifically Generation X, Y millennials, are uh, almost um, dramatically post-tribal. Uh, they really push away tribal labels. And we have to recognize that our community, the Jewish community, is a tribal community made by tribal Jews for tribal Jews. And I don't use the word tribal in any pejorative way. I'm, I'm a total tribal Jew. And what I mean by it is that I identify strongly with the history of the Jewish people, I cast my lot with uh, the current Jewish community in its broadest con conception, including the state of Israel. Uh, and I see my fate tied up very closely with the future destiny of the Jewish people. Uh, it is harder and harder uh, to have next-gen Jews uh, instinctively feel that. Uh, and that's why I call them post-tribal. And all the affiliation patterns and all the data we have, not only from Pew, but the studies that came before it, give us evidence for that. So I th and, and that does challenge a, a philosophy of Kaplan, which is so strong on peoplehood, because peoplehood is simply another term for tribalism, quite frankly. Uh, can it be done? I think it can be done, OK? Uh, but I think increasingly we need to use covenantal language to attract next-gen Jews, by which I mean if we can talk about the way in which identifying with a people slash tribe called the Jewish people can advance values like Chesed, compassion, tzedek, justice, uh, shalom, peace, uh, a view of a world in which we don't see one faith being true and others being false, or that we have some kind of you know, mutually exclusive model that only one faith can, can prevail. Uh, those are values that actually are quite resonant with the next-gen Jews that you, Rachel, and you, Jessica, work with every day. And you know, I'm happy for you to affirm or deny that, but that's how I read it because I've also you know, spent time with that generation of Jews. But I think we need a new playbook, and this is where I'm so excited to see what Jeff's working on, because Jeff is the uh, kind of the, the dean of uh, Jewish educators in our, in our community, uh, for Reconstructors anyway. So how we start to convey some of these tribal peoplehood ideas of Kaplan in a way that resonates in the covenantal language that next-gen Jews won't push away is, I think, the challenge for the next generation. Hmm. Yeah, I think that we're, we're even though we may be post-tribal, I still I still find that the students they they don't want to be reduced to one identity, but they want to belong and they want to belong to something that is unique and different and special, right. um, but they don't want to be reduced or exclusive in that belonging. Tribal yep. plus. Um, yes. Tribal plus. Yes, everyone so, is unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> right, right, Jessica, right. that's right. profound. Um, <laughs> no, but absolutely, I wanna, I wanna echo 100% what what Rachel just said that they're actually sort of waging that internal battle is what I frequently talk with students about. Between I don't necessarily fit in a box, but I want to be in a contained space with a bunch of other people who have something yeah. in common with me. Um, so I don't want to be in a box, but a, but it would be really nice if there were a box around me, <laughs> um, and that that's sort of. Uh, this like, great paradox that's being waged in each individual and in the community at large. Um, I find that there are elements of Reconstructionism that really give us a, a method for dealing with that question, um, and, and that's really helpful, but that is definitely uh, the question on the table. Now, I would, one more final piece, and then I'll turn it over to Dan, that I've been sort of wondering as we've been speaking and throughout the conference, someone mentioned Chabad earlier on and how they're doing it right, and, you know, um, both National Hillel and, and others of us have taken on um, a very much 
this one-on-one -on -one approach, right? This let's meet you where you are and have conversations and try to move them more deeply, more, more deep, more deeper. Um, and and you know, I, I've been thinking: is it that students fall in love with ideas, Jessica, in the classroom? But outside of the classroom, it's people they want to fall in love with, right? It's relationships they want to have. And I also I wonder how that maps onto Kaplanian theology, whether or not it's finding traction. You know, I'm thinking about that. Um, but Dan, do you want to ask us some or ask questions? Can I just add questions? real yeah, quickly I will stop. that there's some things that Kaplan would smile deeply at, and I think of what's happening in Cleveland, Milwaukee, in Minneapolis, and many other communities out of a Covenant Foundation grant where Jewish artists are gathering, getting the support of being with one another, studying deeply Jewish texts, and then using those texts to create their art. So you are meeting them where they are as artists, but leading them through their Jewish connection to some other um, creative expression. I think Kaplan would smile big at that. Great. So um, we still have time for a few additional questions. I have several good ones up here, so keep them coming up by uh, cards or, or text or email as we begin to talk. I want to start by uh, sticking for a moment with this, I think, hugely important issue of tribalism or non-tribalism. I have heard, I wish uh, Deborah Waxman, unfortunately, I had to go back to Philadelphia because of uh, the weather, but she is now the, uh, the leader in every sense of our movement, uh, has talked recently explicitly about non-tribal peoplehood. In Evanston, Illinois, there is an extremely radical version of non-tribal peoplehood being proposed that I don't fully understand. Kaplan, of course, taught us, tri I think was, as Sid said, of course, a tribal Jew. I think I am a tribal Jew, but without the chauvinism, the profound chauvinism of chosenness, which remains the single most radical thing, I think, in a way that Kaplan did. It remains the single most controversial thing. He got rid of the fundamental chauvinism of chosenness, of election. Um, you know, within a tribal so peoplehood context. Yep. And of course, he taught us we can and should live fully in two civilizations, not just one. So what does non-tribal peoplehood mean, mean in any strong sense beyond what Kaplan has already given us? I can't get an answer to this. Anybody want to try? So, am I muted again? Okay, good. Um, actually, you know, um, Jonathan Sachs wrote a really interesting piece. <laughs> he's, he's doing a lot of interesting speaking nowadays about the three different kinds of community that, um, that folks assemble in, especially Jews. And he talks about the difference between Eda, Sibor, and Kehila. And I actually think that those might be, th th which all mean community in different ways. Um, and that those might be ways in which we might give us new language for talking about peoplehood. Um, and Eda, which is a word that, um, you know, camp uses pretty frequently, right? In the Jewish camping world, so it's an enclosed unit of people who um, uh, intentionally are together and sort of have a, a group think. Um, that's sort of, I think, where maybe denominations might fall. Sibor is a sort of a gathered public, people who happen to be in the same place at the same time and are part of the same project, but it's sort of fleeting. Um, and a kihila is people who might be strategically assembled um, to engage in a particular project. And part of what I, I found that really interesting, he advocates actually that Eda is the best form of community in the piece that he wrote about this. And what I actually find is that knowing that we have those three different kinds of ways to assemble folks and using them strategically, depending on what kind of assembly we would like to have, um, might actually be one of the ways that we deal with what it means to be a people, that sometimes we're an Eda, and sometimes we need to be a Tzibur, and sometimes we need to be a Kihila, um, and that we negotiate those depending on what our goal is and who the people, uh, and, and therefore that's how people gather. That's great. I'm having a vision of a now a uh, computer-generated sign outside the congregation Sid founded where a dot can morph into Tzibur yes. and Kihila. <laughs> Depending what you want to see. Uh, <laughs> also, Shalom Arim. <laughs> right? Not many are called a da, like a dot Shalom is. Many are called Kihila or a bait, right? They're called bait something. Um, they're called a home. But we don't have a lot that refer to themselves as a Tzibur, right. as sort of a random haphazard right. gathering of folks. <laughs> um, and we actually don't have a lot that refer to themselves as an Adah. Right. Um, I just want to jump in. 
from this place, and Sid, you referenced Nancy Fuchs Kramer in terms of uh, taking us down an interfaith path for just a moment. One of these interesting challenges of precisely what, what Kaplan did by taking, um, by keeping tribalism but taking away triumphalism. Um, it's very interesting as a reconstructionist rabbi to think about what it means to do genuine interfaith dialogue when for some communities our chosenness is what they wish to be a part of, <laughs> right? right? So as a reconstructionist who is burning the chosen, chosen denomination, yes. thickness, <laughs> um, it's interesting to, when you don't consider yourself elect anymore how, how you have interfaith conversations that are really genuine. Um, so that's been something I've been playing around with here on campus. Switching yeah. gears, we have two uh, questions, related questions about Israel, the state. Um, and what first is posed explicitly for Rabbi Lot, um, I think Rabbi Gardner obviously can jump in. She has the same campus experience here. Um, and one is just a very uh, uh, sort of uh, straightforward question, uh, which is do students, are, do you find students are interested in J Street? Somebody mentioned APAC. Uh, is there much involvement on your campuses with J Street? We have. Uh we have a larger interest in J Street than APAC, but we are definitely have both. There are students there right now, um, and there's a strong voice, strong J Street voice as well. Absolutely. Same thing at Maryland. Um, we have a really strong J Street U chapter, and we also have um, a really strong Terps for Israel APAC chapter, as well as a lot of students who are not interested in engaging in the political conversation at all. Um, and that actually is the, the majority of our students are interesting and in, in connecting in terms of Jewish identity and culture and are not as interested in the political conversation on my campus. And the broader follow-up question is, in what way, if any, do you see Kaplan's ideas being valuable, specifically valuable, in helping your students deal with the difficult issues surrounding Israel today? <laughs> Want to go first? Well, <laughs> or, oh, Jeff, Jeff, you want to no, say No, no, you guys should go first. Yeah. Oh, they're on it. You, you live it. I have a different perspective. Chelsea, you got anything? Because uh, I don't have anything right now. So I'll say, when I was actually trying to prepare for this panel, I realized that Israel was one of those things that, you know, I pulled out that, that piece about that he really thought that Zionism, it was as a movement to redeem the Jewish people and regenerate its spirit. Um, through the, the reclamation of Eretz Yisrael, right? And, um, but part of what he said is um, that it has to foster a sense of interdependence between Jews and Israel in, di in the diaspora. Um, and that it has to give, it said, he, he wrote, I have a little quote here, and then this made me just want to reread uh, all of his writing about Israel and Zionism. Um, it has to give the individual Jew the feeling that participating in that interdependence and interaction makes him more of a person. And if that isn't hugely helpful to the conversation, I don't know what is, because what I was just articulating, that students say, you know, I'm willing to go on a birthright trip, or I'm willing to sort of engage or be connected in some way, but not in a deep way that's real interdependence and interaction, um, Kaplan sort of calls them to task on that in a way that I, as an educator, f could find really helpful to say, um, no, you actually have to participate in an interdependent interaction, and that's what makes you more of a person uh, and a Jew, is being part of that back and forth conversation between Israel and diaspora. Jeff? So <clears throat> I don't deal with the... Uh the college age uh, demographic, but I do deal with teens one stage back and um, work with a master a guy named Amnon Ophir of what he calls soft advocacy. And I've watched him spin an amazing web and been part of that in some ways of having teens form a connection to Israel and to jettison the political dimensions. You can do that better before they're in college than when they're in college. And give them the richest set of experience with Israeli artists, with Israeli writers. And then work with them. This is the always present little mode, little made dynamic that we don't do enough of in Jewish life. After you've, you've immersed them in that work, then you work with them to become the people who convene 
informal, easy conversations in their schools with their non-Jewish friends, with Jewish friends who are distant, about what Israel means to them in a non-political um, discourse. And it's magic at that age if you can do it well. It's hard to do non. It's hard to do non-political discourse at Georgetown. Yeah. Well, I mean <laughs> that. It just. It so just is. I. I want to just uh, say then that when you back up and. Or, when is it over because you haven't started early enough? I would not be faithful to my lifelong partnership and intellectual partnership with my wife, Deborah Schein, where we work on starting with very young children and families and do the hundred languages of children meet the 70 faces of Torah. If we wait till they're teens, yet alone college, and even to the age where they enter synagogues, we're sunk. That, that same biological revolution of neurobiology tells us that our minds get wired in amazing ways, but the most significant wiring is when they are very, very young, and we ought to be paying a lot of attention to that. Yeah, Dan, can I? Mm -hmm. A couple more. Uh, can I jump in here, Dan, for a minute? Sure, just be aware. We have a couple more areas to cover very fast, but go ahead. Yes, I just want to loop back to a point that uh, Rachel made a few moments ago about this issue that uh, if we want to pursue the interfaith path, we need to be wary of the, or mindful of the fact that those who are interested in working with us actually do see us as the chosen people. Uh, <laughs> so it reminds me of a, of a powerful uh, anecdote I want to share uh, that happened when I brought a service mission of members of the Dodge Shalom down to Haiti. Uh, we were deeply involved with the project supporting a school in Haiti. I'd met the pastor who founded uh, the school and a church in Leogan in the center of the earthquake in 2010. Uh, we raised a significant amount of money now uh, to help the school, uh, and we're now organizing our third service mission. When we went uh, on our first mission, I had a group of about 18 people, half adults and half young people, ages 17 to 30. Uh, and each night, the, during the day, we were building houses, um, and at night, I was doing Jewish uh, tech study to frame the whole experience. Uh, the young people had less interest in the Jewish framing. You know, their sense was we're down here to build houses. What's the Jewish thing have to do with it? It was a classic post-tribal push away. Don't tell us this has to be a Jewish thing. We're doing this because we, we care. And then we went to church at Pastor Johnny's church on Sunday morning when the entire experience was about them greeting us as Bible-believing Christians they saw us as, we, as if we had walked out of the pages of the Bible. We were the chosen people who had brought them support, sustenance, belief, hope, the future. And suddenly, without my saying a word, all of our group, including the young people, understood what it meant to be part of a story that begins with Abraham and continues through an arc that teaches that we are the archetypal people that have experienced the trajectory of going from from slavery to freedom, from oppression to redemption. And this is an arc that every people in the world today identifies with. Suddenly, the mantle of chosenness was taken gladly and, and, and with a full heart because they understood it in the covenantal way that I was talking about before. And I tell that story because it suggests a way that we can really capture the passion and the hearts and the minds of next generation Jews because we do sit on something very precious, we just have to repackage it a bit. Okay, okay two more quick, uh, quick but very important questions. This one, there's a lot behind it, and I'm just gonna state the simple question, but under what circumstances, if any, do you feel that the current leadership of the Reconstructionist movement would be able and willing to embrace a radically new liturgy? Anybody? I think, this, I think what's behind this, just to, as I, I'll gloss it very briefly, is the notion that Kohen Neshama, beautiful though it is, is really in many senses a very traditional siddur, basic core Hebrew liturgy that more and more Jews in the pews complain they simply can't relate to. I think that's maybe what's behind this. And is there something, it's true a radical innovation in liturgy possible today in the Reconstructionist movement? And is it desirable? Yes. Um, it, it, it is important. I feel in some ways we're still catching up to Kohen Neshama. I mean, there's so much that needs to happen for people to get the most out of that that I would be patient, but I also love the services we do around Marsha Falk and her predicate theology, and I think there's space for services that are a different mix of 
the tefillat shebalev, the prayer that comes from the heart. We heard that from Kaplan several times about those stories. And the traditional matbeah shel tefillah, the set liturgy. As the middle-aged rabbi in the group, I thought I was reminded young of middle age, young, young middle-aged. Middle what does that mean? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think we're doing it. I was just wondering, on me when you think young middle-aged. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> no, that's me, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, These I, are our kids. I think <laughs> we're doing it. We're embracing it. You know, even if not officially and technically um, through you know the commission of a new prayer book, in terms of living with liturgy, um, there's all kind of all kinds of experimenting going going on. So I, I think there's an openness there, for sure. Great. Last question. It's a big one, too. But we'll touch on it anyway. So the focus uh, here the question, this afternoon in this panel, uh, the questioner posits, has been on Reconstructionism as methodology much more than on movement. So he'd like to hear some comments on Kaplan vis-a-vis -vis the institutional movement. And I'll add somebody else's part to this, so it may make it too big. Do you think that with or without that influence, um, the movement, uh, if it's assuming it stays a separate fourth denomination, uh, will grow, shrink, or stay about the same size over the next 10 or 20 years. How could we reference a dozen different times Kaplan's optimism? And if we think we're B'nai Kaplan, <laughs> of course it will. And I, I actually believe that, Nima Amin, that, that the message of Reconstructionism, both in its institutional form and in other forms, um, will continue to be vibrant and heard and appreciated. Other thoughts, said, Joseph? Well, I, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about this one. The fact of the matter is, denominations of American Jewish life are not going to go away. I'm getting a feedback loop here now, so I can't hear myself think. You're clear here. Right? Yeah. Um, th there's a law of organizational dynamics, which almost guarantees that even after an organization loses all purpose, there'll be a way to keep it going. Uh, <laughs> That's comfort. And, I, I, and I'm not putting that at the feet of our movement. I'm just saying that organizations don't generally go out of business. Uh, some people may know that uh, th uh, three years ago, the American Jewish Congress uh, closed up shop. And then uh, two weeks ago, there was an announcement that Hillary Clinton was going to be the keynote speaker at the annual meeting of the American Jewish Congress that no longer exists. So, so it just, that just pre, proves that to tell my team, even dead organizations come back to life. You can't quite kill them. It's like Freddy in the, in the movies, right? Uh, coming back. Now, now. <laughs> that brings us back to the liturgy conversation. I, I, I think that the walls of the movements, given that they're not going to go away, and, and, and I do a lot of work with seminaries uh, across the spectrum, from Orthodox, to Jewish renewal. I think there's got to be much more collaboration between seminaries both within the Jewish world and between the Jewish world and the non-Jewish world, Christian and Muslim in particular. Very, very important. And I think the more we can make those walls permeable, the more relevant our institutions will be. The more our movements remain insular, the less relevant they'll be. Uh, I run them retreats with rabbinical students from 11 different seminaries, and they walk away saying, They've gotten so much learning from the approach, the hashkafa, the worldview of students who they would otherwise never meet. But frankly, structurally, the seminars are not set up to create that kind of uh, interaction. And so I think we need to, we'll hold on to the forms, but we need to do that very lightly. And I would say, you know, it'd be a major chaval if we didn't have any of those forms left as someone who's gone through the system that, you know, comparing myself to students who have left other seminaries at the same time, we, we stand in a place, comfortably in a place from which to move forward that at least my colleagues of my time weren't as comfortable in that place. So there wasn't that ability to, to be an incubator of, of these ideas and to cross fertilize within, within our community. So I think we would lose a lot um, if that space for real innovation was not continued to be carried and held by our movement. Great. So I'm going to close with Rachel's permission just by reading a lovely comment I just received by email from Rabbi Fred Dobb, it's a successor at our Shabbaton host congregation at Dot Shalom. 
Rachel just said, the question is whether the coming generation has a home in Judaism. My five-year-old Adat Shalomer son was listening over our shoulder, heard it, and exclaimed, yes, I do. Yesh tikva, there is hope. I think that's a nice way to end. Thank you all. This is the formal close, but not the close. Let me explain. I'm going to say a few words of thanks. Uh, very importantly, we're going to uh, free our wonderful uh, electronic and sound team. Thank you all so much. I'll begin there. You've done an amazing job. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying they, well, they went to the extreme of staying over in hotel rooms last night to be sure they could be with us, and that's hugely appreciated. Um, so they're going to shut down. We're going to... Um, Say goodbye to Fred and everybody and uh, his kids and everybody else watching uh, out there. We had at a peak, I think, a total of over 500 people, I'm told, online, believe it or not. That's um, not the entire conference, but uh, overall, which is amazing. And beyond that, I think we'll be seen by a lot more people uh, who will uh, download archived portions of this. We'll also, to the extent uh, people have formal papers they wish to share, and some do, uh, those will all be online. Uh, separately as well. Um, so uh, in uh, no particular order, uh, one housekeeping note. If you haven't already, please pick up a copy of the Jewish Forward, assuming it's out there. W one important thank you is to the Jewish Forward, the primary media sponsor of this conference, and we're grateful to them for all they uh, did in that regard. Um, probably, I think, uh, most importantly, uh, to uh, Georgetown University, to Professor Jacques Berliner Blau, Melissa Spence, Audrey Anderson, and our amazing team of students who have come and gone. I'm not sure if any are, are left. You were, I, I say this, you know, truly from the heart, absolutely, you know, ideal hosts in every respect. And I already told Jacques we'll be back in 10 years, if not before. Uh, seriously, someone's got to celebrate the, uh, you know, the next big, uh, the next big milestone, the, uh, uh, the uh, what is it, 90th, I'm losing track of time, I can't add anymore, 90th anniversary. Uh, we are celebrating, of course, as, as is implicit in all of this, the, uh, the 80th anniversary of the publication of Judaism as a Civilization, and a little belatedly, Kaplan's 30th yard site. Um, so thanks also to McGill University uh, and its Jewish Studies uh, program, uh, department, I should say, uh, well represented here, uh, at least by Eric and, and uh, Dr. Alan Nadler, and, I think that's it, right, <laughs> from Miguel, uh, for all of their work. Um, from my heart uh, to my partners in the Kaplan Center, uh, to Mel Skull, to Eric Kaplan, to Jack Wolofsky, thank you for all you have done and will be doing <laughs> as uh, we move forward. Um, thanks also and sincerely to all of you here. I mean, you made this conference what it is, and, and I'm not going to lose sight of that uh, as well. Uh, I'm not done yet. Then you can talk. <laughs> and then to um, those of you uh, online, uh, as as uh, well. So, Eric, who am I? Um... No, no, I'm not leaving. Out right. He's going to do that. <laughs> I, we're all very tired, but I'm not that tired enough to say how indebted we all are to Dan Cederbaum. His, his energy and his vision are a miracle, and they overwhelm. They overwhelm with the creation of this conference, of the Kaplan Center, and of all the, the website and everything that may come in the future. And I, for one, who have labored in my study for so many years, I'm glad that we're finally out in the world, and I am enormously grateful to Dan and everything that he's done. Rachel wants to, uh, so uh, Rachel's going to give us the closing bracha, which is lovely. Um, the shuttles are running. Anybody who has to go can leave at any time. They'll be out at the gate running between now and 6.15 or so. For those who would like to stay, we're now offline. 
uh, we are going to uh, reconstitute you as an informal advisory board uh, for the Kaplan Center and have, a, I hope, an, an intimate conversation about where we're going from here. I know some people are interested in that conversation. Feel free to leave as we get reorganized here if you must or wish to. And then the, we're also going to allow the Georgetown folks to pack up while we're talking. Rachel? The endeavor of figuring out a way forward as a community is an art, not a science. Oh, what a fulfilling endeavor it is. As Kaplan wrote, the artist is the human being as creator par excellence. Out of a block of stone with a chisel, out of some grains of colored earth or brush, out of a few desperate, disparate sounds or desperate sounds, she can fashion an environment of culture and spiritual illumination. It is in what we create that our personality finds complete fulfillment. Any art, however, which is without relation to the life of the group is meaningless. Art reaches its heights when it is expressed in a, an expression of social life. In looking at the future through the lens of Kaplan, we stand as students and makers of art, gazing at a canvas, brushed, brush poised, hopes high, that in bringing all we have inherited and all that we have yet to dream up, we can paint a future, a Jewish future, that is beautiful, lasting, and redemptive. And so as always, we are banim, children and bonim builders. May all that we have learned and taught one another here these past two days bring us, the Jewish people, and our world to a better place. Amen. <laughs>